have an amazing time, you guys. We have 30 minutes of awesomeness coming from this guy. Uh, have you guys heard of a ketogenic diet? You have? Okay, you well, I had not. So <laughs> um, I'm prepared to learn, and you guys are going to learn a lot more. Please welcome to the stage. Put your hands together for Dr. Dr. David G. Harper, everybody. Thank you, Thank you very much, Alyssa. Uh, I have a prize to give away too, so there'll be a question in a moment, so pay attention. And uh, it's a, a package from, what's the name of the producer? They're uh, Flax Okanagan Rossum. They actually have two outlets here, and there's some beet crisps. Um, so, again, how many people have heard about ketogenic diets before? Put your hands up. So, a lot of you have heard about them. How many feel that they really know what they are? And how many people have tried them? Yeah, a few. Okay, great. That's great. So if you've tried, how are you? Uh, I have a few friends in the audience, which is always nice. So I'm going to take you through the story of a ketogenic diet in a little bit. Um, and uh, first I'll just introduce my, myself. So I'm a university at uh, the Fraser Valley. I'm an associate professor of kinesiology there. I did my PhD at UBC and then I did a couple of postdocs. Um, so right now I'm working with the, uh, in collaboration with the BC Cancer Agency and UBC, uh, studying the uh, therapeutic effects of ketogenic diets, in particular on chronic disease. So that would be uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, diabetes, and, and so on. Um, this is a little bit of a, a caveat. I'm, I, I, the, the doctor title is an academic title. I'm not a physician. Uh, and uh, I don't provide medical advice, uh, but I do research nutrition and I do provide health advice, but it's not medical advice. So uh, one thing I would really emphasize, if, you, if at the end of this talk you're interested in trying a ketogenic diet, pizza doesn't work unfortunately, but, <laughs> uh, but uh, don't do it without, without consulting your doctor first because there are some metabolic issues that come up that we can talk about. I hope you can see this at the back. Um, the, the screen is quite small here, but it's a quote by Wendell Berry. Some of you may be familiar with, people are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health, treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. And unfortunately, this is all too true. Um, they seem to be quite separated. But what we're learning about and what's great about uh, expos like this, and I'd like to thank the, uh, the, the sponsors and the organizers for inviting me to speak to you today, is that people are really realizing that food and health are one and the same that your diet, perhaps more than anything, is, is a, a primary factor in, in health, especially long-term health. So ketogenic diets um, have become very popular recently, and it's primarily because an awful lot of actors, athletes, and other famous people have adopted ketogenic diets. Uh, a lot of the research on ketogenic diets is in athletic performance, and a lot of professional athletes uh, have adopted ketogenic diets primarily because you lose body fat and you gain muscle, and secondarily because it actually increases your uh, mental acuity, uh, awareness, and, and performance. So uh, LeBron James, I'll just name a few of these. LeBron James was one of the first. He lost 20-odd pounds and went on to win the uh, NBA championship after a ketogenic diet. Chris Froome, the twice winner of the um, Tour de France, uh, they thought he was cheating like Lance Armstrong was, and he wouldn't tell him what he was doing, and he finally confessed it was a ketogenic diet that he's been using. Gives you a 50% added oxygen consumption capability, which was some work done by Jeff Volek at Ohio State. Uh, Kobe Bryant, this is um, uh, Lindsey Vaughn here. Uh, of course, Aaron Rodgers, who's playing, is he playing today or tomorrow? I think he's playing tomorrow. Uh, it's ketogenic. Uh, Djokovic, Phil Mickelson, um, and there's some team sports too. It's not just for uh, aerobic athletes, the, uh, the All Blacks of New Zealand, the best rugby team in the world. This is um, Liverpool Football Club, uh, the Australian cricket team, and uh, Columbus Crew are also all gone ketogenic now to improve performance. They've all done very well in their respective fields. Uh, I work in the area of therapeutic uh, research for ketogenic diets. Um, so here's the question. Okay, I can't ask it because the answer is up there. <laughs> I was thinking I'd ask the question, how long have ketogenic diets been around? A long time. Um, there's something called a banting diet or a bant, which was actually in the late 1800s, was discovered that if you remove carbohydrate from the diet, that uh, you lose a lot of body fat and a lot of other health indicators improved. Uh, since 1921, it's been used for epileptics. It's one of the primary treatments for epileptics that are not responding to pharmaceutical therapies. And... Um, 
it fell out of use because we developed drugs to treat epilepsy, but in 1994, uh, Johns Hopkins University uh, started reintroducing it as a therapy, and they've had great success in treating epileptics, and since then, it's now moved to over 200 countries in the world, 200 hospitals in the world in, in uh, a large part of it, all over Asia, North America, South America, and so on. So from a therapeutic perspective, that is to treat specific diseases, primarily epilepsy, but some others I'll show you in a moment, uh, it's become very popular. Uh, here's some of the other uses. There's also a lot, other than epilepsy, there's other neurological um, diseases that have responded well. There's a whole list of them there, including autism and Parkinson's disease, uh, diabetes and diabetes-related diseases, some, some uh, motor neuron diseases like Huntington's, uh, the, um, uh, even some uh, bipolar, schizophrenia, and so on have all shown good responses from ketogenic diets. Therapeutic means sort of short-term, and they're usually quite extreme forms of very low-carbohydrate diets. If you look at the research in this field, you can see almost nothing until about 1994, and all of a sudden it's just exploded. So PubMed is our sort of survey we use uh, to see how many publications there are in the area. So uh, as of just a few months ago, we had a global conference in, in uh, Banff, and there was uh, over 1,800. There's now over 2,000 publications looking at ketogenic nutrition as a therapy. And the great thing about this is, of course, it's drug-free. So you don't have to take drugs, you just need to change your diets. And some of the responses for some people are really quite remarkable. In fact, at the conference I was at in Banff, Mark Matson, who's one of the leaders at Johns Hopkins University in, in metabolic therapies, announced that it's an effective cure for type 2 diabetes. And, and we've actually known that for about 100 years. Again, it just fell out of use because we had drug therapies that seemed to be preferred. So now I'm going to explain to you what a ketogenic diet is. And in, in order to understand this, you need to un understand what the basic macronutrients in food are. And there's three. There's proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, which go under the category of lipids. And all of the food you get in terms of the calories you're burning are one of those three things. So if we talk about the diet that's been recommended by Health Canada and others, it's a high-carbohydrate diet. And if you have a high-carbohydrate diet, you have to limit something else there. So what they recommend, of course, is that you, you limit fats, and you're probably aware of this kind of diet. Um, you can only eat a certain amount of protein. Uh, once you reach about, it varies in the research between 25 and 35% of your calories from protein. And you've probably heard of diets like Atkins or Zone, or um, there's a few others that are high protein diets. And they're generally short-term and often calorie-restricted diets. So a ketogenic diet is not short-term. It's intended to be a lifestyle change, and it is not calorie-restricted. You can basically eat all you want as long as you eat the right foods. So the difference between the diet that's recommended by Health Canada and the diet that we use therapeutically as a ketogenic diet is we are very low carbohydrate and very high fat because if you're not going to eat carbohydrate, you have to get your calories from somewhere else. And if you're limited in how much protein you can have, you have to increase fat. And this sounds crazy to a lot of people because we've, I've been telling people, I had to apologize. As a scientist, if you have a model, which is the way you view the world, and there's new evidence that says that model no longer holds, you must reject that, I, that, that model. And if you're not aware, we are going through a paradigm shift right now in nutrition. The old model of low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet being the only healthy option is not true. And in fact, for some people, the high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet is beneficial and I would like to differentiate between low carbohydrate and ketogenic, which is actually means the production of ketones. I'll explain what they are a little later. So here's the, uh, the diet that's recommended now. You've probably heard of this. Limited protein, limit fats, especially saturated fats, getting most of your calories from carbohydrates. Uh, it's not actually supported by science. It never has been supported by science, and I'll talk about that in a few slides. This is a low carbohydrate diet where you limit uh, protein, you, you, you increase your protein, but you're limiting carbohydrates to about 20% or less of your calories. So 2,000 calories a day, that's about 400 uh, calories of carbohydrate. And if you're good at math, a gram of carbohydrate times four is how many calories it is. So if it has 25 grams, that's 100 calories. Um, the ketogenic diet, uh, and this, by the way, low-carbohydrate diets are, are very healthy. And I would also like to say, that there is a healthy form of a high carbohydrate diet, which is a pretty strict vegan diet. So if you want to try that, that's fine. If that's your preference, 
the high, high carbohydrate vegan diet that has very low fat is a healthy diet. The other healthy diet, I would argue, is the, completely the other way, which is a high fat, low, car low carbohydrate diet. Of course, what we're doing now is somewhere in the middle. We're, we're mixing fats with carbohydrates, and especially high glycemic carbohydrates, the worst of all is sugar. And that's where you end up with the, health, the chronic health problems. So this is a ketogenic diet. Less than 5% of your calories are coming from uh, fats. And that actually uh, forces your body into a condition where you have to produce the glucose it needs, which we call blood sugar, um, uh, by alternate means. Now, as we're looking at these carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, um, I want to re remind people those are the only three groups there. And um, that there are only two of those groups that have essential nutrients in them. Okay? So who can tell me which two groups of the three are essential between fats, carbohydrates, and protein? And you get a prize. You have your hand up there. Proteins and? And carbs. Oh, she had the wrong answer and then changed it. Correct. There are essential, <laughs> the, woman, uh, the woman in the second row there, there are essential fats. You might not realize that, essential fatty acids. In fact, I'd say they're good for you. There are lots of essential fats, uh, and there are essential amino acids. You probably know it. There's no such thing as essential protein, or sorry, essential carbohydrate. There are good carbohydrates, and those are called fiber, and those aren't digested in the same way, so they don't fall into the macronutrient, but you can have fiber in your diet without having carbohydrate. All the other carbohydrates end up as blood sugar, and the amount of blood sugar, the amount of glucose in your blood right now is about a teaspoon. It's not very much and your liver can produce that very easily as needed. And that's what happens in a ketogenic diet. So where did we get to this idea that fats were bad? Well, it came from this guy, Ansel Keys, in the 60s and 70s. And he basically uh, had the notion that because Americans were getting bigger and fats were the highest density food, and he looked at pathologies of people that were getting cardiovascular disease, and they had these fatty plaques in their blood and so on. So he said, well, it must be all these fats that Americans are eating that are causing these fatty plaques. And since it's a high energy thing, it makes sense to take that out of the diet. That takes the most calories out. And it's kind of a calories in, calories out story, which we know is a far too simple way to look at human metabolism. Now, he actually became very um, domineering within uh, nutrition. He became uh, the chair of the American Heart Association and so on, which was small. And he, he basically took charge uh, for about 30 years of all the research done in the United States of the diet heart hypothesis. And he worked with another fellow here, Mark Hegson. Uh, Mark Hegson was at uh, Harvard University. Uh, he is the author of the dietary food guide that still exists, uh, which, which calls for a low fat, high carbohydrate diet. You may have heard last fall that there was a researcher a long time ago who was paid by the sugar lobby to say that fats were bad and it wasn't sugar. How many people heard that story last fall? It came out of a couple researchers at University of California, Santa Barbara. That's the guy. <laughs> this is Ansel Keys. That's his buddy. That's the guy that said that. That's the guy that wrote the US Dietary Guides. He was paid $50,000 in 1970 to do that, to demonize fats, which today is worth about $330,000 which at his point in his career is a pretty nice little package. They tried for 20 years to prove that fats cause disease, and uh, they always came up with zero, except for trans fats. And trans fats are artificial. Those are those hydrogenated vegetable oils. Those are not good. I took a few pictures just of 1950s. I just Googled 1950s crowds to see what people look like. And it's, you're probably a little far back, but if you look at those people in the crowds, and then you look at 2010, Google crowds, People start looking different. They get bigger. These are US pictures, right? They start getting bigger. You th this is pretty common. And people are thinking, this is just normal. Just, you know, you get older, you get big. That just happens. No, it doesn't. It happens because we've basically conducted an experiment for 30 years on people by giving them a high carbohydrate, high sugar diet. See what happens. What happens is people get heavy, they get diabetes, they get cardiovascular disease, they get cancer, and they die early. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible thing we've done. Uh, these people here running around the track, what do you think their profession is? Any guesses? <laughs> no? <laughs> They're police officers. They're police officers. So 
we've known now, this is 2006, we've known now for 10 years. We've known now for 10 years from a number of different studies. They did eight studies and they uh, basically showed that there was no link between the ingestion of fats or saturated fats and any chronic disease on their own. When you mix saturated fats with high glycemic index carbohydrates, and just to show how, how many people know what high glycemic index means, so I, it means it gets absorbed very quickly, raises your blood sugar very quickly, that that, uh, that will cause disease. But if you don't eat the high glycemic carbohydrate, take it out of your diet, you can have all the saturated fat that you want. Um, this is George Mann, and his qualifications here are beyond reproach. Um, he, the diet heart hypothesis put forward by um, folks at uh, Harvard University of Minnesota, he just said it's the greatest deception of our time. And I, and I believe that now. And I think, you know, if you want a conspiracy theory, there's a book by uh, Nina Teichholz called Let Them Eat Fat. I don't know if any of you heard that, but it's a really good book and she exposes the whole conspiracy well. So the new science basically says this. It's very, it's, it's simpler than you'd think. Obesity is caused by a number of different things, but the majority of obesity in North America is caused by excess carbohydrate um, in the diet. So when you eat sugar, you secrete insulin. Insulin's a growth factor. It also causes increased fat. So you eat sugar, that raises insulin. Insulin takes the sugar out of your blood, puts it into fat, also makes you hungry. So you eat more. What do you eat? More sugar. And it just works slowly. And you can usually resist that in your 20s and 30s. When you get to your 40s and 50s and so on, it start, kind of starts to show, right? And it was starting to show on me too. So good thing is you can reduce carbohydrate and reverse most of this. So here's how the diet works. You restrict carbohydrates, but you still have to produce blood sugar. So your blood sugar is produced by your liver. It's a natural process called gluconeogenesis. As you do that, you actually use fats and amino acids as a fuel uh, and as a raw material. So you begin to use up your fat stores. And what's kind of nice is you start with your mid-abdominal fat, and what we call visceral fat, which is the worst kind of fat to have. Uh, as you in increase your fat intake, it's also very satisfying. That's where flavor is, by the way. If you've ever tasted any carbohydrate without sugar or salt in it, it's cardboard. It has no flavor. It doesn't taste like anything. So the food companies put all kinds of stuff in to make it taste good. But fat is good. That's where flavor is in fat. So uh, when you eat more fat, even though you're taking in more uh, calories, we don't worry about that because it's more satisfying. You actually eat less. Uh, over a few weeks, your body converts to ketosis, and there is a metabolic change that I, I don't have time to describe today, but those of you who are interested, I can hang around a little bit after, but this is why you should consult your physician. There is a metabolic change that occurs that activates these genes for ketosis, and there can be some unpleasant side effects for a little while. They're not uh, terribly, um, import they're not terribly uh, um, concerning, but they are uh, something you need to think about. And so you begin to uh, burn more saturated fat. So you can add all the saturated fat. I have a very high saturated fat diet. I get my blood work done all the time. And my triglycerides, which is the important number, are very low. They're right near the bottom because I'm burning it all the time. So there's a little uh, uh, diagram here. Uh, oh, the, uh, before I move on, the other thing that's produced in a ketogenic diet are ketones. And ketones are actually beneficial. This is not like ketoacidosis that happens with diabetics. This is a mild form of what we call nutritional ketosis. And the major ketone produced, which is called beta-hydroxybutyrate, long name I know, it's actually a very beneficial uh, molecule that your brain uses preferentially and that your other tissues use preferentially. And it actually resists oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is one of the important components in cardiovascular disease and cancer. So when you go to a ketogenic diet, a lot of those chronic disease mechanisms are reversed. So it's almost like a rejuvenating effect. And this just shows a picture of the liver doing its job, uh, taking the fatty acids and the uh, amino acids and converting them into uh, glucose and ketones, which your body then, then uses. This is a high fat, low carbohydrate diet. If it's less than 5% of calories, you're likely going to start producing these ketones. It's called ketogenic. Who eats a ketogenic diet? If we look at traditional diets, this is the uh, Inuit on the top left, the Maasai top right, uh, pygmies of New Guinea, bottom left and bottom right, ab aboriginals from Australia. You'll notice they're all really lean. And you notice that basically anybody on a ketogenic diet is going to be really lean because they're burning their body fat as needed. And these populations, like the Inuit up north, on their traditional diet, which can be up to 90% saturated fat, because there are no carbohydrates up north, they have, and I, I'm, I'm not using this term lightly, no cancer, no cardiovascular disease, no diabetes. Feed them our diet, 
they begin to get obese, they get diabetes, they get cancer, they get cardiovascular disease, and they die early. But on their traditional diet, which our friend uh, Richard Mathias at UBC has been studying for decades, they don't get chronic disease. And this is essentially all of these people eat ketogenic diets. These Maasai young males, they drink seven liters of cream a day because they basically just eat cow blood and, and meat and cream. That's all they eat. And a, and a few little vegetables, not much. Uh, here's the Inuit studies showing, uh, in particular this region here, this is on our diet, the blue, uh, and on the red diet, that, that's their, the rates of cancer. Inuit, the red, would be on their traditional diet, the blue is on our diet. And there's been lots of studies on these uh, to indicate that that traditional First Nations diet is really good. A lot of people ask me, well, what is carbohydrate? They'll go, well, do bananas have carbohydrates? Do beans have carbohydrates? Uh, yeah, they do. Um, there's really two kinds. There's different forms of sugar. Uh, the worst form of sugar is something called sucrose, which we call sugar, table sugar, which is half glucose, half fructose. Glucose we can metabolize, but it raises ins uh, insulin levels. Uh, fructose is a known hepatotoxin. That means a liver toxin. It's a known toxin above about 25 grams a day, which is not that many calories. You get, you get twice that in a Coke. It's a known hepatotoxin. So it is actually toxic to your liver. Your liver has to detoxify it. When it does, it produces all kinds of byproducts that cause inflammation, that cause deposition of plaques, that cause insulin resistance, that cause uh, changes in your brain. Some people even think fructose is addictive. And I don't like that term, but people certainly have substance abuse issues with sugars, for sure. Uh, the others are starches, and starches are just a whole bunch of glucoses put together. So it just turns into sugar. And then these fibers, and fibers are fine. I, 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 fibers on a ketogenic diet are fine. So you can have oat bran, wheat bran, uh, that sort of thing. But we tend to restrict all of the other forms of sugar, because really all carbohydrates that you use metabolically are sugars. So beans, grains, potatoes, bread, pasta, rice, and most fruit. Now the fruit that I eat is just berries. I limit it pretty much to berries. And the reason is berries do have some sugar. Uh, we could talk about why plants put sugar into foods. Again, that's a longer story, but the, um, the berries are packed with all kinds of really good phytochemicals that are kind of worth it. So if you're gonna get your carbohydrates, you wanna get it from something that's gonna be packed with other nutrients that are beneficial, uh, or drink wine, which I like to do. So, <laughs> so I get a lot of my carbs from wine. Wine's not too bad. So I'm just going to show you a few slides with some research. Uh, I won't go into too much detail of the research because we don't have time for that today and I want to answer some questions. Um, but this diagram here, this just shows glucose levels and insulin levels over the day. And the blue line is, uh, actually it's not even ketogenic, it's a low carbohydrate diet. And the upper diagram is uh, the standard North American diet. And so as you can see, when you switch to a low carbohydrate diet, this is not even ketogenic. Whoop. Uh, there's much lower levels of glucose and therefore much lower levels of insulin. So you can actually uh, re reverse insulin resistance by about 75% or increase insulin 70 sensitivity by 75%, those of you who have type 2 diabetes, within about a month. So on a ketogenic diet, if you're taking metformin, you may not need it which is another reason why you need to consult your physician because you may have to reduce the uh, medications you're taking, particular for blood sugar and for hypertension. Uh, again, I'll point out just the, uh, the Westman diet. This is a ketogenic diet. These are changes in blood lipids, and you may not be familiar with these, but notice they're all dropping, and the, the pink ones on the right, the ketogenic diet, are dropping the most. So reduced uh, hemoglobin A1C, reduced glucose. Uh, uh, the LDLs don't change much. The HDLs actually improve. Those are the so-called good cholesterols, and they go up quite significantly. Saturated fats increase HDLs, by the way. And you can see the triglycerides. Five minutes? Perfect. Uh, and I'm showing this study. I, I won't, I won't, again, I won't go through the details here. This is a study in Israel because some people ask me, what about long term? This is a two-year study done in Israel. And in Israel, people tend to eat their main meals at the beginning of the day. So they went to a company that fed their uh, uh, people at the company, the people who work there, so they could really control what they were eating for the most part. And really what this shows is after two years, the effects are persistent. So a ketogenic diet is not a short-term thing, it's a lifestyle change. Uh, this is just the beta-hydroxybutyrate molecule. It's quite a simple molecule. And I, <laughs> this one is from uh, the conference I was at. It shows the neuroprotective nature of, uh, of ketogenic diets. Um, and this is what we think uh, reverses some of the effects of epilepsy, Parkinson's, um, and other, um, uh, both psychological and neurological disorders. 
So I've developed, uh, this is a book that I'm just finishing called Biodiet, which is, uh, I haven't produced yet, but it's essentially a how-to book. And um, this is the kind of things you eat, which is greens and anything that grows above the ground that's not a, a green or, or a grain or, or a bean. Uh, some seeds and nuts, berries, chocolate, a little wine, lots of nice healthy oils, and whatever uh, meats and so on you need. And the research I've done in the cancer agency, here's just two quick slides of a pilot study. This shows compliance with the diet long term, after six months and a year, uh, compliance with the diet and your CRP levels, C-reactive protein, which is the basic inflammatory marker that cardiologists use to see your likelihood of cardi cardiovascular disease. So these folks down here are highly compliant with the diet, and over here are less and less, and then this person is off the diet altogether. And we see this persisting for years. Uh, the other one we've shown with the cancer agency, we look for other markers for cancer. They're called inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. And what we discovered there was compared to a control group on a normal diet, those on a ketogenic diet had an upregulation of the, uh, of the uh, immune response to a challenge. So what we do is we take blood samples, we challenge it with, with the bacterial and viral vectors, and we see how robust the immune system is. And we see significant long-term effects on an increase in immunity. And a couple of recommendations here. You can read those. As I, I, I have a little, working with the cancer agency, I came up with a little um, sort of a meme about uh, how, how you can view it. Cancer cells, what most people don't realize, cancer cells really only eat glucose. And insulin is a growth factor. So when you eat a high sugar, high carbohydrate diet, what you're doing is you are selectively feeding cancer cells the food they eat and sprinkling on some growth factors to help them grow. So we think there's a reason why um, this low, high carbohydrate diet actually, actually augments the growth of cancer cells. Now the good thing is, in the reverse, if you take carbohydrate out of the diet, it limits the food that cancer cells use, and they can't use the hydroxybutyrate. So it limits the food and you limit the insulin secretion at the same time. And by doing those two things, you limit the growth of the cancer cells. At the same time, what we've shown at the cancer agency is we're upregulating the immune response. So we're slowing the growth, and, we're, and, and in particular, the kinds of cells that are anti-cancer cells are called cytotoxic T cells. They'll actually go and destroy them. So in animal models, we've seen this response. In human models, we've seen the changes in biomarkers that relate to this response. So here's basically a couple of just recommendations. And the last, the, the one most important thing I would say is try and get sugar out of your diet, like sucrose. And it's, and it's hidden in foods. They use all kinds of different names, dextrose, maltodextrose. There's 25 different names. But if you can do anything today, take home messages, please get sugar out of your diet as much as you can. And there are sweeteners. We have a sweetener uh, just over here, Swerve, erythritol. It's a natural sweetener. Uh, I don't work for them, by the way. It's a natural sweetener. It's, it's made, it comes from uh, berries. There's also one called xylitol. It's a natural sweetener. It comes from birch trees, like maple syrup comes from maple trees. Those are natural sweeteners that, that work very much. They taste like sugar, and they work very much like sugar, except they won't leaven bread. So if you need that sweet taste, there are alternatives for you that are also natural. Uh, and here's some other things that you can enjoy. Uh, lots of meat. I especially like grass-fed meat. I think that's very good because the omega acids and uh, nuts and seeds, and uh, the diet I eat is basically a very healthy, I eat no processed food, unless you consider cheese and wine to be processed. No processed food, it's gluten-free, it's anti-inflammatory, uh, and uh, it's a very, uh, I would argue, a very healthy diet. So uh, thank you very much. How's the time for that? Pretty good? Okay, okay. On. So we do have time for a few questions. Um, do we have any burning questions in the audience? First hand I see. Well, I, I think I we have a microphone that's going to come around so everybody can hear the question too. Um, I'm just wondering if it's possible to be vegan and still get your um, protein, like your essential amino acid needs and vitamin and mineral needs on a ketogenic diet. Yes, yes you can. Um, it is a little bit more of a challenge. <clears throat> and if you're vegan and you're using no plant materials at all, uh, the one angle on that is, you're go is the substitute for a lot of the protein is going to be soy. And because soy is an estrogen disruptor, actually soy is a very healthy product, but it is an estrogen disruptor. So if you're a woman that's planning on having kids, you're probably going to have to eat too much soy at that point. Uh, but other than that, that, that would basically, so a lot of tofu, they have like shirataki noodles, there's a company here that 
uh, sells those. There's about five or six, by the way. I, I congratulate the, um, the organizers for having a category for ketogenic friendly foods. This is fantastic. And you're going to be hearing a lot more about it uh, as time goes by. Uh, we have a lot of questions. OK, so sure. <laughs> I'll try <laughs> and keep my answers first. short. Just a quick question. Uh, would coconut sugar also be all right? Uh, not coconut sugar, no. Anything that has sugar in it is probably going to be a, a carbohydrate of sorts. There are like honey, maple, all that sort of stuff. They're all, they're, they all have sucrose of, of, of some sort in them. And again, you know, if I was going to have a sugar, what, like what you don't want to do is have sucrose because that's got the fructose in it. And you can say fructose or fructose, it doesn't matter. Uh, and that, that, that is what you want to try and avoid most of all. Sorry, I can't hear that. Oh. Uh, well, yeah, the, you can try the Swerve. They've got little packets there. That's a, a healthy. It doesn't, uh, xylitol does digest a little bit. Some people get a bit gassy. Uh, erythritol doesn't do that. So grab a packet from them and give it a try. I think there's one down here. Hi. Um, I was wondering, what's the difference between a paleo diet and the ketogenic diet? Is it Another excellent the question. Same thing? So, the, so the paleo diet, I think, is a fine diet in its own right. But that's where you come up with the idea cavemen didn't have this, so we must eat like cavemen, and then they try and fit the data to it. Mm. Paleo diet is, is uh, basically, the difference would be they eat a lot more fruit and a lot more sugar, and they don't eat dairy, uh, with the notion that that's the way cavemen ate. <coughs> um, that is not as supported by science as a ketogenic diet in terms of its outcomes, but it is, I would argue, a healthier diet. It's a good way to go. And they actually have a, the Bob's Mills, they have a paleo, uh, a paleo flour, which I'm going to give a try. It's, it's got a lot of almond flour in it. Yes, there's a woman here in the purple. I don't think I can move fast enough. How is, how is xylitol and erythritol metabolized? Uh, actually, xylitol is broken down by um, the bacteria in your gut. It, do, it only produces about two, gram, two, uh, two calories per gram. Um, and uh, that's what some people, depending on their gut biome, they can produce a little bit of gas. Uh, about 80% of people don't, but some people do. You will adjust to it. Uh, erythritol actually isn't metabolized at all. So it just passes right through you. They're, they're, called, they're called polyols or sugar alcohols, but they're neither sugars nor alcohols. Yeah, some people can get that. Some people can get uh, changes, either constipation or diarrhea sometimes. Yep. Hi. Um, this diet, if you're not, okay, this diet that you're uh, mentioning, the ketogenic diet, how does it help uh, people that have like a generation to generation diabetes and are insulin dependent? Yes. Um, <coughs> Generational, uh, well, type 2 diabetes has a much stronger di uh, genetic link than type 1. And diabetes is now kind of a spectrum. Um, but those with a genetic predisposition, uh, the thought is that they probably have a decreased tolerance to carbohydrate. So because virtually everyone is on a high carbohydrate diet and they have a genetic predisposition to develop diabetes through metabolic syndrome and so on, that they're more susceptible. And so by removing the carbohydrate from the diet, that should have a counteractive effect. Yep. And actually, there are, there are some groups in, in California that have long-term longitudinal studies on the effect of type 2 diabetes, and they're getting 90-plus percent response rate, complete removal from drug therapy. Yep, if they stick to a ketogenic diet. Yes? Hi, when is your book coming out? And until it does, can you recommend some resources? Uh, I can. My book is coming out uh, this year. My wife is here. My wife keeps saying this is my wife here. Uh, she's ketogenic too, by the way. Uh, but um, she keeps asking me, when are you going to get that damn book done? <laughs> so I'm going to get it done this year. But you know what? Um, I am working with a guy named Jeff Volok, or hoping to, at Ohio State. Jeff Volok has worked with uh, Stephen Finney. They had P-H-I-N-N-E-Y. Volok is V-O-L-E-K. They both have worked with a fellow named Eric Westman at Duke University Medical Center. And the three of them together wrote a book called The New Atkins Diet. And that's a very good, very well science uh, validated diet. It's a very healthy diet. And those three people are very, very clever, well researched. By the way, most nutritional studies, so when you hear a nutritional study, new nutritional study, most of them are not very good. It's really hard and really expensive to do controlled experiments on humans because we have to eat. And so long-term studies are extremely expensive to do because you basically have to imprison people and then feed them the food you want and measure things, which is hard to do with anybody. So what a lot of people do are these meta-analyses. 
which means they go back and they look at all the previous research done and then they combine all the results and come up with something. And I, I actually have almost zero faith in those. Uh, in science, we generally say if something is more than 10 years old, we don't really pay much attention to it. Most of the early studies that support, supported, uh, apparently, high carbohydrate diets, uh, the year starts with a one, which means it's more than 15 years old. And so if they're sifting through that stuff to try and get you know, some statistical demonstration of uh, significance, I, I, I don't really buy it. There are some really good controlled experiments ongoing now. And all of, all of the research, really since 2000, but especially since 2005, all of the good research at the, by the best people at the best institutions are all indicating that sugar is really the demon, not saturated fats. And really, you need to go vegan or you need to go ketogenic to have the healthiest diet. Now, would you recommend with the ketogenic diet going cold turkey with everything else or slowly kind of um, slowly getting into it to allow your body to adapt right. to it? Uh, there is an adaptation phase. Um, there, are, there are both methods. Um, of course, it, takes, it can take months if you do it slowly. Uh, the metabolic conversion can happen within usually a couple of weeks if you do it cold turkey. Uh, what the book, BioDiet, demonstrates is a, is a methodological way to do it. So there's a first phase that kind of gets you prepared. A second phase, which is the most critical, is the is the uh, uh, bio uh, metabolic conversion. And, and then there's sort of an ongoing maintenance. You'll, you, 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 I lost 27 pounds of body fat. I'm not a big guy anyway, but I lost 27, and I didn't look too big. My wife calls me chubbinaceous, you know, and I get a little bit. But, but I lost 27 pounds of body fat. My body fat percentage went from 20 to about nine, which it is now, uh, and, and I'm in my 50s. So getting into my late 50s now. So, <laughs> so, and I, so I was able to reverse it. It happened within about 12 weeks. Uh, you'll lose about, depending how big you are, about 10 to 15 pounds in that first two weeks. Most of that is water. And then you lose about a pound to two pounds every week for uh, about 10 to 12 weeks. The well, most I've had lo lost is 70 pounds in one year of people that I've uh, been helping. Well, both you and your wife both look fantastic. So Thank I you. think it's a... Uh, there's one more question in the back, and I'm, I'm not in a hurry, so I'm, uh, she's been waiting, so yeah. So this will be our last question today. Last question, yeah, thank you. I would like to know how much water one should drink. Yes, a lot. Okay, so... He, how much is a lot? So, if you think about the way people drink, what do most people do? They get up in the morning, what do you do? You make coffee. Coffee's good. You can do, coffee with whipping cream is what I drink, or tea with whipping cream, high fat, it's all good. Um, so... Most people get up, they drink coffee, they keep drinking coffee. That's, a, that's a, a diuretic. It makes you pee out more water than you take in. So you're losing water. You're losing water all day. You know, you have your lunch. Then you have dinner, you have a glass of wine. or beer. That's a diuretic too. So you're dehydrated. You wake up dehydrated because you haven't drunk all night. You dehydrate yourself all day. You go to bed dehydrated. So we're in a constant dehydrated state. So what I rec recommend is when you get up, start with half a liter of water. Drink a half a liter of water when you get up more or less as quickly as possible and work your way up to a liter of water so you're starting your day hydrated and then continue to hydrate yourself all the time during the day. So I just constantly drink water or tea. I, I, tea is good, coffee is good, wine and water, that's really all I drink. I don't, by the way, fruit juices, even though they're said to be healthy, are chock full of sugar and sucrose and fructose. Uh, so are a lot of yogurts. So you can't, now yogurt's a kind of interesting one because yogurt will have some sugar in it because that's what they feed the bacteria to turn it into yogurt. So the sugar on the label is actually not the sugar that's in the product you're eating because it's already been fermented. Um, so if you get regular unflavored, unsweetened yogurt, what you can do is put some swerve or some xylitol in there with maybe a little bit of uh, uh, vanilla and uh, you have vanilla yogurt, tastes fantastic, and, and high fat. Get the high fat Greek yogurt, it's fantastic. Well, I think that about wraps it up. I swear you could do like an hour long on Q&A. Thank you guys so much for uh, asking all those wonderful questions. And thank you very much. Please put your hands together for Dr. David G. Harper. Thank you all for coming and for, uh, for staying and listening to my talk. I appreciate it. I'll be available for a few minutes after if anybody has any questions they weren't I able to get answered. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>